seem to be seeing the suspended sediment and everywhere. Potentially sediment off the bank, whether it's a nicely vegetated area, a relatively healthy riparian zone, okay. or someone's lawn going down to the river without much vegetation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I would also say some of you know this, but we have asked DEQ their opinion of of administering this type of turbidity under the Clean Water Act. And we don't have a response from them yet. Uh, we think it's coming soon, so it'll be interesting to see where they go with that. Okay. Because anybody, and I would point out, anybody else doing an activity that would cause this turbidity that's not natural uh, would either have A, a permit, and would not be uh, allowed to do that, or B, if they didn't have a permit, they'd be cited in some fashion. So just putting that out there. It's a real clean water act issue, I think. The, the, the little thing of not natural is the point in this, in this Yeah. When, when we say that there is a not natural turbidity, we have to be super sure that we can demonstrate it. Right. That is not natural. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, um, you mentioned the uh, homeowners or landowners having good practices for the riparian areas, but I'm wondering if there's a way that we can um, educate people and if we can take it to that next step that Katie mentioned of how do we repair zones once they have eroded, how do we keep them strong in those areas where there are slides happening? Um, and I'm, it's sort of a different uh, a complementary issue maybe, but how can we educate people? I'm thinking about the property that we lived at, um, with so much waterfront, it was almost entirely blackberries and ivy right there by the river. So property owners had not taken care of it, in my opinion. I mean, you could see that there were sword ferns underneath, and you could see that there were red twig dogwoods along uh, some of the bank. But really, it's being taken over, too. So kind of as another complementary issue, how are we protecting and educating people along the bank so that we can have really stable uh, banks there and, you know, working against those invasive species. So, not to throw a wrench in things, but this is another thing I think about as I'm along the river. Like, are we, do we need to do some sort of larger effort to protect this area in terms of investing in plants and education? Yeah, I mean, I think you're asking me. Sure, if you want to, or somebody in the room, if anybody can speak to that, because I think it, we need to take it to the next level. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that type of stuff has happened, whether you're looking at, you know, Audubon's backyard certification program, which can play into that. You can uh, look at what your local soil and water conservation district or watershed council would recommend. There's a lot of great ideas the out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I meant that first. Um, but there's a lot of things people can do to help make their riverbanks and yards generally more uh, natural, if you will. So all of that, I think, could be beneficial. I don't know that in every case it will mitigate against the impacts of what we're seeing, but it's a great place to go. And frankly, on that stretch, in anywhere in Metro Portland, the same thing goes for Kaiser, uh, where there's a huge swath of homes and a giant riprap bank. Some of us are familiar with that. Uh, it would be great if more people went that route, because um, as it is today, we see a lot of green lawns going right down to the river. Right. So. So um, just a, a quick comment on that. Um, we, Kerry Rappold has left, but he's the city of Wilsonville's natural resources director. And we have been working with him um, to find a site that would be a um, fit for essential salmon habitat and everything that we've got going along the river to make a model restoration site for people to come see. Um, and, and then maybe that could be carried through to organizing along the river. Mm -hmm. and, and as a group, we've also been working with Department of State Lands and uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to try and help facilitate permitting processes because part of the problem is it's very difficult for the average um, person, number one, to understand um, how we restore these but to go through the permitting process has really been very confusing for people. It's also very expensive. Um, we've got an estimate on our embankment personally that's between $100,000 and $150,000. Um, and that is just average. So you, we're talking millions of dollars along the river that people are going to have to spend. And you end up 
in a situation where we're not sure we want to restore it because if we do restore it and we've talked to the city of Wilsonville about this are the fail the failure rate so we could restore and then a year later we'd have to restore again so that's that's part of the problem about getting everyone organized to do the right thing um, right now what has happened and I've seen it happen people do the wrong thing in that they're doing it illegally and they're just going I know one home they went in the middle of the night and dropped thirty thousand dollars worth of rock over their their embankment and that's how it's being handled because you see it all up because no one knows how to deal with it so so anyways, it, that's a whole other problem. It really is, but uh, <laughs> that's like that's the problem that we want to address once we address this, I guess. Big doctor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I want to point out just one thing that uh, a picture worth a thousand words. Yeah, and yes. Movie camera is even uh, better that we can predict it. Uh, you know, say tell you how fast the poles are, are moving, but even a uh, uh, a still picture, I can still tell you how fast the boats are moving. Really? Yes. Uh, oh. If you remember the picture that I showed you earlier, subcritical, supercritical, mm -hmm. uh, I can see that this one is traveling at sub subcritical speed because it had transverse waves. Okay, and you can see those. Mm -hmm. And this one is traveling at supercritical speed, you don't see the transverse waves. You only see the radiation wave and then a straight line wake in the middle. So if you know the property of the weight, the length of the ship, I can back calculate, and the water depth, I can back calculate how fast the boat is moving. So, but obviously, I would prefer video camera to tell you how fast it is. Okay, but that, that tells you the damage level too, because the weight patterns are different. Just those minor details, we can actually tell you how it will affect the whole dog. So, yeah. One thing I think would be really helpful in all this is uh, I'd love to get here in the morning before the activity starts and, and do the video because I think that would really uh, go to Pedro's comment that how do we know this is a result of that activity. That would really just highlight it. Assuming I can keep the thing in the air long enough to <laughs> get 42 minutes, that's it. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> All right. That's better than my drone. My drone can survive five minutes. <laughs> but of course, I have 800 bucks on it. <laughs> so, Katie, were there other um, key questions that are for the whole group or uh, things that, that I forgot to talk about? Yeah, does anyone else have anything that they're really interested in, um, any further discussion? I mean, uh, we, could, we could go down the road of restoration. That's a whole other thing, um, but... I'll just start a conversation about what OEF is going to say. So, if you're interested, I think it's so, very part of the conversation. So ODF and W, um, I've had, and Renee was at one meeting, but I've had three meetings with them. Where's Travis? Travis has met, met with them over the years, like how many times? Um, they actually have some statute um, that potentially could help us put an end to this, but they are not willing to um, use their authority um, to make any changes. They, they've pretty yeah. much said, um, yeah, they pretty much wiped their hands of it. Well, they stand behind policy not to get involved with specific legislation unless it's their own. Mm -hmm. okay. That's difficult. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. You know, they're not really managing our issues. Yeah. This is a clear case where up the Malala River, as an example, there's an easily listed run of winter shield it. Well, you know, when they're staging, when their smolts are going and coming down to the, down out of the river, that's exactly when all this forbidden is happening. Mm -hmm. Right? So if they're really a stakeholder in making sure that those fisheries are managed, they set it. Yeah. So we're gonna have to make them set it when making that an issue. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, because one of the things I was thinking about when I was 
sitting there on the Fourth of July, just watching this melee, melee go out into the water. Right? Was, you know, there's so many kids and there's so many people driving, you know, pulling boats with the kids and all, and that's great. But you know what? What if you made it an issue for their future? What you're doing today is destroying the fisheries for their future, destroying this river for their future. Sounds like a good movie. But you know, it, it's it's taking all the factors and like, telling the story. That's one of the dimensions of the story. Right? The of the story. And and so um, bringing ODF and W to the table again, we've tried. Um, and I think Travis could say the same thing. Correct. What was that? You like this? Yeah. <laughs> All that. Put the words in your mouth so you can just repeat this. <laughs> yeah. John was asking about ODF and W and where they stood in and why they don't act. They are ill-equipped to act. Uh, they just don't have the political wherewithal to stick their necks out on an issue like this, at least at this point. And, and we tried numerous times. We met with them. Even their own biologists point to the presence of both adult spring chinook and juvenile fish in that stretch, or stretch just above it actually technically, but they're around. Randy and, and his crew have counted numerous spring chinook in there during the summer months over the years, and that's just one species, and only worth mention because it's listed as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act under that. So that's where it's frustrating, especially looking at the amount of money being poured into the Willamette Basin to improve conditions yeah. for those species and, and others. Not to say the cost of the rep uh, restoration projects and how so much of that will go down the drain, actually. Well, I think a, a really good example, di completely different issue. Um, when I first, I'm new to the board. I've been on the board since um, March. And before that, for a number of years, I would have mentioned there's an advisory committee for issues. Um, and one of the really big issues that started percolating up in 10 years ago so was the fire boats. And everybody said, oh, Marine Board, it's boats, it's your problem. And we're like, yeah, but it's hazardous materials in the water, it's DEQ's problem. Oh, but wait, it's DSL's problem because it's DSL's land. You know, so everybody's doing this. And finally, getting people who are concerned about the issue to talk to their legislators. And the legislators that are on the committees that oversee those different agencies. There's starting to be some cooperative and also getting it into the counties and the cities helping out on this issue. Um, the Marine Board, in consort with those other organizations, is moving forward. And so I think this is another thing where, again, there's so many different things that that plane of it is aside from the weight that the fisheries and endangered species. The fact that the Marine Board has you know fishing guides and a bunch of stuff that we legislate, you know, it may be another one of those. Let's let's take this village and try to move this issue forward on the village, or have the village move the issue forward. So working with the legislators that oversee those agencies to really push the issue. We've spent millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, on salmon restoration in the region, and a couple of really small things are screwing it up. To get the agencies to stop doing this and start doing this. Now, typically, I'll just tell you from this, this working with the FW. They move when their budget's at risk. When the legislators step in and say, well, we're not going to budget this next year. Yeah. We're not going to do the job. Yeah. That's, that's so, you know, get them where it hurts. Right. So you look at the Fish and Wildlife Board, mm -hmm. it's all political appointees. They define the policy for you. Mm -hmm. So you got to get some of those guys to step up, or some of to step up on, on their team. It's an issue. Take action, but they generally don't until the legislature tells them to do it. Well, the other thing is when you get the when you get the floor at the signal and the Marine Board having openings, get your people on the business after. I mean, the Marine Board made a big change what, two years ago? I think it was by putting Jim Quincy on the board, who was an avid canoeer. Who? Um, for all of a government appointment. Right, well, the Marine Board is a governor's appointment, too. But somebody, they started really pushing and saying, we need to have a non motorized voting advocate on the Marine Board, and they put her on the board. And I'm the evolution of that process. So, um, you know, maybe it's time to get some other kinds of people onto that board and have people really advocating for it. And I think our current governor is a person who might be open to that, that thing. 
but the, like the controversy about the wolf people, that, those people were appointed because there was nobody else trying sure. to get those trying to get those seats. Um, if it's an uncontested appointment, where do you go? Yeah, we just changed seats on uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission, but it wasn't a transparent process. So I, I hear what you're saying. When we proposed our own people. You know, this is I'm talking about the Coast Conservation Association. Um, and they just went our own way. So well, one of the things that we had proposed, or at least talked with the governor's natural resource advisor recently, was it's great to have paddling folks on the marine board now, I think given the nexus with the board's decisions related to river and or water body health, maybe a biologist or somebody with a you know extensive background in one of the biological sciences. Yeah, Jeff, you want to add so, so when do we get the, um, so you guys talked about modeling and doing the experiments on a multi-year study. We're trying to figure out whether we have something with that data modeling information that we can take someplace and do something. I guess that's in the end, that's where the road meets the road, right? And we have to feel comfortable that we can stand behind the data, make the argument. I think Well, you know, it actually, data. it's important because that just tells us how much time we have. You know, had I known what I know now, in the beginning of the, the spring, I would have done some things differently. I would have filmed all the little fish by the dock, or jumped in the water, grabbed a shot, we going to look at all the stuff. I didn't get a chance to do that this year. Next year's another year. Right? So, trying to figure out the intersection point. We'll actually have data, we'll actually have models, we'll actually be able to present something to counter or propose something. Well, so keep in mind that we have very little to no money of what we're doing that Kara's talking about. And these guys, um, I don't, I'm assuming that you're not able to do studies unless we get some of the grant money or something. So, we're doing a lot of both. Yeah, so I, I, maybe you guys can comment on that, but a lot of what was talked about today was things that we would like to do or could do. So we ask for grant money from the state or the Marine Board? Or, I'm not sure you would ask offer that money. Uh, you know, I, I wrote one grant, and I'm not very good at it, and I got turned down. So that, that was the end of my grant writing career. Um, Travis obviously has grant writing history, but yeah, that's a problem. There's there's just that or fundraising. Right, right. Yeah. right. Well, identifying your roadblocks is part of the process of figuring out your problem. Yeah. Are there other uh, sources of federal or state funding that you guys look to for your research? Um, well, I mean, we typically work uh, through uh, National Science Foundation or DOE or, or land grants or sea grants, but um, they have specific solicitations and those solicitations happen whatever they have the money and then you are kind of fine to it. I'm trying to imagine a nexus between Sandia Labs and, <laughs> and this project. No, but you could find a conservation group like Nature yeah. Conservancy or River Keepers or just a cons consortium of them yeah. to come up with piece, a piece of it as a part of the funding of the grant, right? Because you have to somehow explain the problem and tell them what it's going to take to, to find a solution. So for your study, Kara and Heather, Heather sorry, um, you're not sure if you'll be able to get the other instrumentation in the water even though you just got the permit this summer. Did I understand that right? Well, we just got the permit this morning. This morning, okay. Mm -hmm. So my research students have one week left. So I just can't imagine that they'd be able to get staff gauges into all the sites within that amount of time. 
we need this stat pages because it'll improve the accuracy of what we're doing with the cameras and it'll improve the number of sites that we can actually collect data at. So it's just a process. Um, the types of grants that we're talking about typically take about a year to get funded um, if you get funded in the first round, right? So I think all of these things are just useful pieces of information as people need to find these steps. And what sort of budget are we looking at for all of this? Like what? Different components. Well, you feel free to ballpark it. <laughs> right. It depends. It depends. I mean, I suppose what, what, do you, what do you think if we did the drones and the um, instrumented? I mean, it could be. Could be anything between 200 and 100. Right. Oh, there, there are elements of it though you could yeah. bucket out, right? right. Somebody could pick up a bucket of it, like yeah. mm -hmm. the drone work. Well, Travis can do some. I've got a production company that probably collects drones. And, you know, those are ways through volunteering that you can fill some of those gaps. Yeah. Right. How much data does that give you? As a person, how much data does that give you to have six drone videos throughout the day showing the difference in the water um, from various spots? Right. Well, then that would give us, then we'd be able to estimate erosion and turbidity from that. So, you have to do it not only every day, we have to do it also uh, the different days of the week um, right. for the whole season and off season. Yeah. But I think there's a short term and a long term, right? Right. I think that's long term. Mm -hmm. There's a short term if our objective is to have some change happen for the next season. You gotta start curing the short term. Yeah, I think the drone really is very helpful. Though. Yeah, that makes a lot of information. My son sent one from earlier today where there's some boat traffic, it's just a and you can see the bottom of the river versus normally it's just mud when it's easy. So um, I think that that's something we can do between, you know, he has a drone, he has a drone, have access to the drone. You have volunteers on the river that can fly a drone three or four times a day, especially on the weekend. That's what we're going to see the most. But even during the week, in the afternoon, on a hot day, that river turns chocolate. What are some other uh, chunks of data collection that could be done uh, for different prices? I mean, so you guys are talking about some research looking at um, uh, different size boats, different weights, different, you know, you're talking about the weight research. Are there small chunks of that or ways that you can piece out parts of that that could be funded? Um, yes, the, the, we can separate it into what one is the modeling, yeah. and another one would be the, um, the ground data, no? so the validation of the modeling. So uh, uh, survey of the boats and uh, to correlate the wave that is generated you know, in five or six different types of boats mm -hmm. in a relatively short time duration and a type of experiment that was done by, by my partner mm -hmm. to, to create a, a validation data set which is separated from, from the data. Mm -hmm. I would say that are, those are clearly two, two okay. I have another question. One of the things that's been swirling around, I know the city of Portland and on up is talking about you know projecting the number of folks moving into the area over the next Ten years, and the increase we're seeing increased congestion everywhere. And you have finite resources, whether it's a highway or a river, and the more people moving in, and the number of boats will be increasing because there's no no measure to let people on the river at any point in time. So we're predicting more people into a small river. I don't know how that would fit in with some of the studies because it will only exasperate right. the situation. Yeah. But it is, it is predicted to go forward. You know, I know Corlin's talking about another, what, 10 million people or something like that. Yeah. Uh, or 2 million, that's all I'm sorry. And so, thank <laughs> <laughs> you. I guess, you know, as we're seeing this now, how can you start recognizing and looking, I uh, look to the Marine Board too, in the sense of I uh, look at policy and how we look to manage that because it's not going to get better probably. And um, rather measuring what's happening in the river, but also I'm not aware of any, any information that counts the number of 
boats in that river on a on a Saturday, and it and and you know they come from different places. So I mean, it, it all starts to factor in of how do you manage this resource that is finite and um, needs to be protected. And as you have more people and more in different philosophies, if we can do whatever we want on this river, and it's only going to get worse. And uh, Bill, oh, go ahead. So I think that's a really good example of I've kind of been sitting here thinking about this. And that, so one of the things we heard, I think, repeatedly this morning was that it's not, the problem's not as simple as just the singular, the bigger the boat, the bigger the wave, the more erosion, right? So like, let's say that we decide we want to, say, weight boats of X amount of weight or that create weights this size or band other one. We successfully do that 10 years from now. You're going to have a 20, 30 percent increase of the number of small boats on the river that are still creating lower level but more consistent weight, which what we were told today will still continue to cause erosion. So, what I'm about to say is probably going to be very unpopular. So please take this with a grain of salt and understand that, like I see and I understand, like what the concern is here, specific to the weight boating issue. As someone who's been in policymaking conversations in this state and with the legislature for quite some time, um, as a way to try and help you, the one thing that I would say to you is that as you have these conversations, if the question is how do you mitigate and repair erosion on the banks of the Willamette, that is a different question than how do you stop weight boating because it's causing erosion. And so I would just really encourage this group as you go forward with the conversations to have your conversations in reaction to the science and the math that gets presented rather than looking for science that supports the, the problem that you're trying to solve. Because it may be that if you solve this problem, then a different, well, but then a different problem that's currently in the making that we're just not seeing yet comes along down the road. But we've been so focused on solving a specific element of this problem that we don't really get to the arc overarching issue. So I just, I think that there's some really great signs like here that we saw today in the works, but I also know that, you know, there are a lot of other places if you, um, you know, want to look for different studies or you want to design a specific study, like, you know, there are, funding I know is hard, but um, I just wouldn't, I would just really encourage this group to be open to what you get out of this science and what that informs you rather than the, the opposite approach. Because then when you bring it to the policy makers, that's a much more compelling argument for them. And I think you're right. And I think that through our legislative process this year, um, during all of the opportunities to testify and such, what the committees seemed to respond to wasn't so much the erosion. It was really about safety congestion, property damage, and erosion and uh, habitat is all part of that. It's all one big problem. Yeah. But what they responded to, and you'll hear over again and over again, is the little kid on the deck she was going to over and when the wave hit. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think in some ways we have to moderate the message. I would, to what we know is gets response. I would piggyback on that and also say earlier in the conversation, I think maybe we were talking about um, salmon migration, but at, at some point someone had essentially said, you know, we're, we're kind of getting off topic, this is a different issue. I would argue that it's not a different issue, that it is all of these things are together, right? And like particularly if you're talking about ODFW resistance, then maybe one of the things you want to consider is you know, what is, what's the scientific question that you need to pose to get answers to, to how this is impacting, you know, Sam, and, and there, you know, you guys are seeing it, um, but if you can commission someone to provide you a study that does that math and science, um, and I think, right? <laughs> and I think, like, photographs are great, and technology lets these scientists extrapolate more and more information from photographs, but beyond photographs, you know, I would argue still, maybe because I'm, you know, a little old fashioned, it, you still need the science and the math behind it, you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, I would just, I would just, 
you know, no pun intended, I wouldn't get focused on, on the one flow of information for, you know, you know, a human activity or wake boat, but, but rather if, if, it's, if, if it's the effect that you are trying to mitigate or change, like look at uh, the different things that are going into a cause and effect. Well, today the one thing that stood out to me was Desiree's presentation, and she pointed out clearly, and I know Travis knows this, that those those salmonoid, those Chinook, are mm -hmm. are in the water in June yep. and in May, and we have been, I've been hearing for I don't know how long, oh no, when that, that's during the winter, and the, you know, that's all done, that's not an issue in the summer, and that was one of the fish and wildlife point, uh, points they made to us, Katie, that, that, you know, that's not such a big problem in the summer. Yeah. And those so boats are only on the water. Right. 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 You're right. I'm going to say one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, that's what makes Chinook so wonderful of a species. They have different life history strategies. And those juveniles uh, move from upstream to downstream of all different sizes. Sometimes they go out when they're that big. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they wait a year or two years in the upper river before they go out. Mm -hmm. And they have, that's why they can survive as long as they have, is they have all these different life history strategies. Mm -hmm. So in June, you're going to see juvenile Chinook there. In the winter, you're going to see juvenile so it's not just you know two months out of summer, it's year round. Um, so we have to take care of them all the But you know, they've okay, got they've got a, a incredible tough life. You, you, we're just talking about one aspect of you talking about you know, Lamb Falls, how they get upstream downstream out, the ocean conditions, uh, the toxicity in the lower river. I mean they've just got you know, predators, uh, hatchery influences. I mean, I feel bad for a bunch of they've got a tough life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and we that's, can that's, control that turbidity yeah. to some point. And but that's, a, you know, we've talked about trying to get in there and sample the, the, the fish community in the lower river. It's incredibly difficult. We've sampled back in 1988, but a lot of new rules have come into effect. And you're not allowed to sample with the gear that we usually use, which is electrofishing, when the water temperature is 64 degrees. Well, that's, you know, we're way above 64 degrees right now. And so you can't go in the sample, it's uh, no fisheries and we'll never allow it. And so the only time you can really sample would be in the early spring. Uh, that's when the adults are coming in, so you can't sample then. And so there's a very limited window when you might be able to sample because of the rules and regulations. And that's also the time when uh, there aren't many boats around. So our hands are tied. Uh, the other problem is you maybe could go do a snorkel survey, but you could imagine your distance of being able to see what a mass is. Uh, fish is pretty limited with the debris you have. So, uh, studying juvenile Chinook or other fish is just not, you know, a fish with an adipose and lots of other native fish in there. Um, it's extremely difficult given the, the conditions of the river down there. Okay. So, on that, mm -hmm. I'll say one more thing and then I'm done. Again, <laughs> this is, you know, 